Hey there, Kazan here, and welcome back to Always Doing. Today I'm continuing my best books of 2018 series, thing, triptych, trilogy, whatever you want to call it, with my favorite nonfiction of the year. A bunch of these books are from nonfiction November, but some are from before I started my channel as well, so a nice mix here. Let's get into it. First is White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide by Carol Anderson. This is a book that infuriated me and shocked me and broke my heart in turns. It talks about the struggle of African Americans through history to get the basic rights that everybody should have. When I was in school, a lot of things about slavery and African Americans in general was taught in the sense that there was this awful thing and then there was a court case that fixed it the end. But this book showed me very viscerally that it wasn't so easy. That even after a court case that said that, hey, no more segregation, that the powers that be, like the white guys, would do everything they could to prevent them from being able to exercise those rights. The underhandedness, the, the lying, the awfulness of so much of it really stuck with me. Anderson is an academic and the last half of the book is endnotes and there is so much there. So if you want to know anything else about the subject area or what's going on, you have plenty of resources to go to. It may not have been the easiest to get through, but I got so much from it. Next is London War Notes by Molly Panter Downs. She was living in London during World War II and she wrote a weekly column for The New Yorker talking about life in London and the surrounding area and what it was like. This book covers from the first rumblings of war through the Blitz to VE Day. It's not every article, it's about half actually, but it's still a hefty 459 pages and at times it felt kind of long. I didn't have trouble getting through it. It's not like I put it aside and wanted to forget about it, but it was one of those things that just constantly, it took me a month of just constant reading to get there. If you have any interest whatsoever in what life was actually like on the home front, this book is perfect for you. Her attention to detail is amazing. I learned about so many different things I didn't know about, like blackout deaths, because, because there was a blackout during the blitz, meaning no lights, so cars would be running without headlamps, and they would hit pedestrians because they couldn't see them. And those were blackout deaths. I mean, I had no idea. On top of that, she's so witty and sharp and observant in general, and she can tug on your heartstrings if she's determined to. So this was a great look at history for me, for someone who's not really all that into history. Next is a nonfiction November book. It's Letters from Max by Sarah Rule and Matt Ritvo. Ritvo had cancer when he was a child and was in remission when he took Rule's class at Yale University and Rule was teaching a playwriting class because she's mainly a playwright. After the class ended, they ended up becoming more like friends and fellow writers. Ritvo is a poet and Rule, while a playwright, dabbled in poetry when she was younger and always wanted to get back to it but never felt like qualified to. And anyway, in this friendship, they're writing letters, basically emails, back and forth to each other, and this is the collection of those emails. As Max ends up relapsing with his cancer and going through all sorts of treatments, writing poetry the entire time. He actually convinces Rule to start writing poetry again, and those poems are a large part of what's in here. I wasn't expecting that when I first went in, but I really liked it, especially Rule's poetry. Just really just got me right here especially because you can see how images are born and things that they were mentioned in their letters or just a thought or an image that was spun out will appear in a poem and knowing all of that backstory makes it all the more powerful. The one line description would be the end of life being observed by two poets and I, I don't know if enjoyed is the right word but it was quite an experience to read. The next book is one that I am so excited to talk to you about because I have not seen it on booktube and it deserves so much more attention. It's Invisible, how young women with serious health issues navigate work, relationships, and the pressure to seem just fine by Michelle Lent Hirsch. This book is own voices for serious health issues as well as being queer, and it is the most intersectional book that I think I have ever read. It's part memoir, the author goes into her serious health issues that she had starting in her 20s, if I remember correctly, and how that affected her relationships and her work and even just regular conversations on the street. 
Like she had hip surgery in her 20s, if I'm remembering correctly. And so on the bus, she asked if someone would give up their seat for her. And she's like, I just had hip surgery and had the crutch to prove it. And the person was like, no, you couldn't have had hip surgery. You're too young. And it's like, well, no. She also talks how it affected her personal relationships, as in romance. She found that guys would often have a hard time dating somebody with chronic, serious medical issues, and she had a lot more luck on the queer side of it, and I just thought that was really interesting too. But it's not just a memoir. She interviews all sorts of women who are dealing with similar issues from all different walks of life, and uh, trans women, and queer women of all sorts, women of color, women of different faiths, and it, that's where the intersectional part comes in because they talk about how their health issues interact with their race or their gender or their sexuality or any number of other things. I also like that she allows the interviews to basically stand as they are. You get to hear a lot of direct quotes from these women that she's talking to. We get to see really what these people think in their own words. Nicely written eye-opening for me and I work in healthcare and that's one of the reasons I picked it up as well so I can better serve my patients and yes this book should be getting more attention. So I'm looking back at my list now and I'm realizing how much misery in it. I mean we have racism, war, death, chronic illness, and now I'm going to talk about nuclear weapons. But in a weird way this might be the most quote-unquote fun of the batch. It's command and control Nuclear Weapons, The Damascus Accident, and The Illusion of Safety by Eric Schlossler. I read this one as an audiobook and I'm so glad I did. It is so gripping. It's split into two narratives. One is the history of nuclear weapons, but not quite such in a dry way. It's more of the history of the accidents that have happened with nuclear weapons. And you realize that we should all be dead several times over by now. I mean, nuclear weapons dropped into the sea early detection systems that mistake the moon coming over the Sweden for ICBMs, planes with nuclear weapons burning up on a runway. Like, we, there should have been several unintended detonations by now. In this section, I learned so much. And for example, one of the things that stuck with me is that the scientists and the military were often at odds. The scientists wanted to make the weapons as safe as possible, so they wanted you know, different systems to safeguard, double checks, triple locks, authorizations, but the military hated that stuff. At first I was confused because that's safety and you don't want your soldiers blowing up by accident, but actually the military wants to be able to use the weapon as quickly as possible. So with as little authorization, as few safeguards as needed. It was something I didn't know about that I just sort of blew my mind. So that's one half and it's interleaved with a narrative description of the Damascus accident. And if you do not know it and you want to read this book, do not look it up. The shortest version I can give you is that there's a missile silo and something goes wrong. That's all I'm gonna say. I didn't know what it was and I was so glad because the author does an amazing job of building the suspense and of what happened and you just have to know how things end if everyone turns out all right. This is one of those books where I can remember where I was when I read it and what it was like to read it and I even though the audiobook is super long I blew through it in something like a weekend. It was incredible. So there we have it, my favorite nonfiction of 2018. Have you read any of these? Do you want to read them now? What was your favorite nonfiction read of the year? Let's talk down in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new. And tomorrow I will be back with my last favorite video, fiction. Can't wait. See you then. Bye.